All right, hello. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the second video lecture in the Unwrapping Plastic series. This lecture will cover the impacts of plastic on people and planet. The first video lecture covered the relationship between plastic production and climate change. This is a series, so I would recommend starting with part one if you haven't already seen it. I guess I'll introduce myself again. My name is Andrew Jarvis. I am the current public education and outreach intern for the Monterey Regional Waste Management District. This lecture falls under the Unwrapping Plastics umbrella. In addition to these lectures, we have written blog posts on our district website. I'll put a link to that in the description for further reading. The blog posts expand upon the topics covered in, in the lectures. So I like starting with quiz questions just because they're fun. This first question is, which country was the first to ban plastic bags? Your options are Bangladesh, Norway, Japan, and Bhutan. So the answer to this one is Bhutan. Bhutan is a really tiny mountainous country in South Asia that borders Tibet and India. And it was the first country to ban plastic bags in 1999. This was a ban on the thinnest plastic bags. Next question, which state has banned plastic bag bans? So this is a ban on the banning of plastic bags. Your options are Michigan, Tennessee, Arizona, and Idaho. So the answer to this one is all of them. It's a trick question. <laughs> so 17 states have passed state level bans on the banning of plastic bags. These are known as preemptory bans because they preempt local jurisdictions from banning plastic bags and often other single use plastics. So again, this lecture is covering the impacts of plastic on ecology, economy, and equity. First, we're going to talk about environmental health, then the politics of plastics, the geography of plastics, and then the human health impacts of plastics. So we'll be covering environmental justice in this lecture. So starting with environmental health, the effects of plastic on the environment, it's pretty well established that plastics are devastating for the environment and especially for the marine environment. And the marine environment tends to get a lot of attention due to the visibility of plastic in, in the ocean. This is an image of a sea turtle caught in fishing line. But in addition to marine plastics, it's also really important to consider the impacts that plastic have on terrestrial environments. This is an image from an, an open dump in Sri Lanka. I believe it's in the north of the country. The dump site borders a na national park and there's no separation between the dump site and the national park. So the elephants have wandered over into the dump site. So when we're talking about marine plastics, the example that has gotten the most attention is the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. The Great Pacific Garbage Patch is between California and Hawaii. It is the North Pacific Subtropical High. So essentially, it's, it's an oceanic gyre, which is where warm and cold ocean currents meet and circulate. Something that not a lot of people realize is that there's five main oceanic gyres. And the Great Pacific Garbage Patch is just one of those gyres. So because there's five main gyres and there's plastic all over the entire ocean, this means that there is more than one garbage patch. So for example, in this image, you can see that there's a Western garbage patch in addition to the Eastern garbage patch, which is the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. And in the subtropical convergence zone between the garbage patches, there's also plastic pollution. Whoops, I'm gonna move myself over so you can see. So I, I like including this article. It's titled, Whales Spotted Swimming Through Great Pacific Garbage Patch for First Time. And I like to include it because it helps visualize the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. The garbage patch is much, much less of an island of plastics and much more of a soup of microplastics. Microplastics are formed from larger pieces of plastics called mesoplastics 
that break down through weathering in the ocean as they're battered by the waves and also from insulation. And so the larger pieces of plastics break down into ever smaller pieces, but never truly go away. Um, and that's how you end up with microplastics. So because there is such a high volume of microplastics in the ocean, there's projected to be more plastic than fish in the ocean by 2050. I'm going to move myself back over so you can see. So because plastics impact politics, knowledge, the environment, the economy, and people, I argue that they have been politicized. This essentially means that plastics have political power and the industry, the petrochemical processing industry, and by extension, the fossil fuel industry also has political power. One example of this can be found again in how 17 states have instituted preemptory bans on bans. These bans are done in the name of protecting businesses. So the argument is that businesses have the right to decide whether they will give consumers plastic bags. And this is important to consider, especially from a Californian context. We're very fortunate to have progressive environmental policy here, but the single-use plastic and plastic bag bans that we see in Pacific Grove, for example, in Santa Cruz, they're not possible in all localities across the United States. So there's a linkage between fossil fuel producers and plastics producers. ExxonMobil, Shell, and Saudi Aramco all have petrochemical processing plants. These are plastics manufacturing branches. This is an example of vertical integration between the fossil fuel industry and the plastics industry. So in part because of this vertical integration, the 5.2 trillion that is globally spent on fossil fuel subsidies, a significant amount of that is functioning as plastic subsidies. And again, this is because there is so much linkage between the fossil fuel industry and the plastics industry. So when we're talking about the impacts that plastics have on knowledge and especially the politicization of plastics, we're talking about the discursive construction of waste. Discourse is a term that's used in the social sciences. It essentially means that the way that we talk about things and the way that we're presented information about things shapes how we understand them. So the main components of the discourse surrounding plastics uh, there's two main components. The first one is waste as the assumed endpoint in a capitalist system. So our current economic system that we have prioritizes consumption and at all stages of the life cycle of a product, so in production, transportation, consumption, and disposal, there's assumed to be waste. And a product is always assumed to have an end. Uh, um, to have an end of life. The second component of the discourse is recycling is espoused as a blanket solution. Again, recycling is part of the solution, but ever since the advent of commercialized recycling, which grew around the same times that plastics became popular, recycling has been espoused as the solution to the litter problem or to the pollution problem. And the problem with recycling is that it doesn't address the amount of plastics that is produced in the first place and it places responsibility on consumers. An example of the plastics industry influencing the discourse surrounding waste and plastics more generally can be found from Hylex Poly in Seattle which was lobbying against a ban on plastic bags and in favor of a tax and their statement is Moving consumers away from plastic bags only pushes people to less environmentally friendly options such as paper bags, which require more energy to produce and transport, and reusable bags, which are not recyclable. This is an example of greenwashing, which is when a product is, or a practice is presented as being sustainable. So in this example, plastic bags are framed as being more environmentally friendly than paper bags. So greenwashing is presenting a practice or an item as more sustainable than it actually is in order to 
sway public opinion of, of the item. Another example of the impact that the plastics industry has on knowledge comes from Plastics Europe, which is an agglomeration of plastics manufacturers in Europe. <laughs> And their annual report that they put out in 2019, there is a statement that said, plastics are valuable resources that bring numerous benefits to society by offering sustainable solutions in countless sectors. Whether caused by irresponsible behavior or poor waste management practices, it is deplorable that plastics are littered. So here you can see that the responsibility for pollution is placed upon consumers and governments rather than consumers. I emphasized here, that plastic is, according to the report, that plastic is made into pollution through irresponsible behavior or poor waste management practices. So this is fully placing the responsibility onto consumers and governments. And it is deplorable that plastics are littered. So not that plastics are produced, but rather that they are littered by people. And one final example comes from plasticsmakeitpossible.com. I came across this website while doing research into the process of plastic production for the first video lecture. This is an article by Professor Plastics and the first line reads, ever wonder how chemicals become plastics? It's magic. So again, the way that information is being presented about plastics is framing it as a sustainable and kind of like a wonder item. And it influences how we relate to plastics and how we understand them. So now we're going to cover the geography of plastics. So before we start, I wanted to take a little bit just to ask a question. So how might the plastics crisis be related to geography? I'll let you think about that for a little bit. <laughs> All right, so because plastic pollution is a global crisis with acute local consequences, it has a really unique geography. Essentially, when we're talking about the geography of plastics, the idea is that plastics don't affect people the same way in different places. So different regions of the world, primarily developed countries, have produced the majority of the world's plastics, but it gets distributed through the across the globe through global waste trade flows and the global recycling system and plastic pollution doesn't affect people the same way so people in marina or monterey are going to have a different relationship with plastic pollution than people in mumbai will have or people in bangkok and part of that is due to the differing forms of waste management that exist in different areas of the world. So thinking about the geography of plastics, one of the main points here is that a way is a place and people live there. So there's, there's the idea that we can throw something away. And uh, this isn't an option for, it, for everyone. There is a theory called waste distancing that covers this. And the idea is that uh, consumers in the global north have the capacity to distance themselves from the waste that they produce because they're able to throw it away. But when you throw something away, it doesn't just disappear. It, it actually goes somewhere. Oftentimes, waste goes to low-income communities of color for processing. And the waste management district is one away but we process recyclables we only recycle a few items when recyclables are sent to the waste management district we then uh, process them and sell them onto the global market so again they're going to be shipped elsewhere often in the united states or in southeast asia but the Global flows of waste through economic markets has resulted in differing concentrations of waste in different geographic areas. And this is especially true in the post-National Sword era. National Sword is the Chinese ban on imports of recyclables that went into effect in January of 2018. 
In 2017, 60% of the waste that was exported from the most developed countries was sent to China and Hong Kong. In 2018, after the Chinese government placed a ban on imports of recyclable materials and other forms of waste, that amount dropped to 10%. So there was a very drastic reduction in waste and plastics that were sent to China. And the result of this is flows of waste on the global scale changed drastically. And it essentially threw the recycling system for a loop because previously all of this recycling was going to China and now it has to be rerouted. So developed nations are historically responsible for the production of the majority of the world's plastic, but we've seen an externalization of waste processing to poorer countries. This has historically mostly been to China, but in the post-national sword era, waste is primarily sent to Southeast Asia for processing. So this means that countries that are least responsible for waste are hit hardest by its social and environmental harms. The impacts do not align with levels of production. And it's for this reason that it is argued that plastic pollution is an environmental injustice. When we're thinking about how plastic relates to environmental justice, it's also a deeply geographical issue. So again, thinking where is pollution geographically concentrated? So Cancer Alley is a region between Baton Rouge and New Orleans along the Mississippi River. It's a corridor. And it's a hotspot for petrochemical processing and manufacturing facilities. It's known as Cancer Alley because the jurisdictions along this corridor have very high cancer risk rates. And the highest is the jurisdiction of Par Reserve, which is a parish. Reserve is this purple one right above New Orleans. So Reserve is 60% black and has an average per capita income of $18,000 its cancer risk rate is 50 times the national average. So it has the highest cancer risk rate out of any jurisdiction in the United States. This is due to petrochemical processing, specifically the manufacturing of chloroprene, which is a key component of synthetic rubber. I apologize that this map isn't the clearest. I'll put a link to the A Guardian article that was written about Cancer Alley that includes some really good maps for visualizing this concept. This is the only map I was able to find that wasn't copyrighted. <laughs> it's from the US EPA. So when we're talking about environmental justice as it relates to plastics, we're centering people who live on, off, and with waste in the discourse surrounding plastics. People living on waste refers to people who literally live on top of waste. It's quite common in developing countries and low income countries for slum settlements and other forms of housing to be built directly on top of open dumps or landfills. People living off waste refers to anyone who makes a living from working with waste. So this includes waste pickers, waste workers, and people like me. People living with waste comes back to the idea of distancing. So if you're not in, the, in a place where you can distance yourself from waste that you and others produce, then you live with waste and you, it's difficult to separate yourself or distance yourself from that waste. This could be due to low waste collection rates or also due to living in rural areas that again have low waste collection rates. Another issue when it comes to environmental justice and plastics is drainage. So plastic film, so that includes plastic bags, can block storm drains and otherwise impede water flow, which is a really significant problem, especially in areas that experience monsoons. The stagnant water that results from the impeding of water flow leads to a proliferation of disease vectors, such as mosquitoes that can spread mm -hmm. malaria. And it also leads to an increased risk of floods, again, because it impedes the water flow. And these floods are what prompted Bangladesh's 2002 ban on plastic bags. So it's been established since 2002, at the, since at least 2002, that plastic bags cause a significant amount of environmental harm, and especially for communities who live along waterways. This image is of waste workers in Brazil. I believe it's in Unipolis. 
And I included this just to demonstrate that this is, when we're referring to people who live on often with waste, we're referring to waste workers such as this. And oftentimes waste workers work in very dangerous conditions with little to no personal protective equipment. So coming back to the idea of, of blame for waste and the externalization of responsibility for waste being placed on consumers. So blame for waste, consumption and pollution has long been placed on consumers. This leads to issues of accessibility, especially when it comes to clean drinking water. It's really important to not blame people for consuming plastics. Again, high levels of plastic consumption have been normalized and not everyone has access to clean water and food that isn't packaged. And it's especially important when it comes to clean water. For example, people who live in Flint, Michigan or in Sihanoukville in Cambodia don't have access to clean water because it's contaminated. And so you have to drink from a bottle if you're, if you're living in these areas. So again, it's just really important to refrain from blaming people for consuming plastics because it's no one consumer's fault that so much plastic exists. So there's a disconnect between consumption and pollution. Again, this is the idea of waste distancing. So a lot of the times this is due to a lack of education. And again, waste distancing is mostly true for consumers in the global north. So the last point here relates to livelihood generation. So coming back to the econ economics of plastics, the title of this news article is Plastic bags are killing horses and cows across the state. What's Texas to do? So there's livestock such as horses and cows and also goats consume plastics, thinking that they're food and it subsequently kills them as they're unable to digest it. And this is a very significant problem. There was a study done in Nuakchot, which is the capital city of Mauritania. And it was found that 70% of the cattle and goats that died in the capital city were killed due to plastic ingestion. This means that for farmers who depend on animal agriculture and also aquaculture for their livelihood, plastic poses a real threat to the sustainability of livelihood generation. And yeah, so this is the last slide in the presentation. Next, we're going to be covering the issues associated with plastic pollution management. So that'll be coming in part three. Thanks for tuning in. As always, if you have any questions, shoot me an email. I'll put my email in the description. And feel free to check out the blog posts that are available on the district website. Thanks.